Today we're going to continue in chapter 14, 1 Samuel, and I'm actually going to take you from verse 16 to the conclusion of the chapter. And, and in, in these verses, um, there are a lot of summarizations, things that, are, that we'll be reading just so that we continue and get through this particular chapter. There are some points of application that will be made, but a lot of it is summarization and just information that, uh, that uh, is necessary for us to get an idea of where King Saul is in his life and all. And so we'll do a lot of reading today, and I'll be touching on a few things and hopefully making some application in certain places. So let's begin reading at verse 16. I'll read to verse 23, and we'll get into our study. 1 Samuel chapter 14, beginning at verse 16, reading to verse 23. Now the watchmen of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away. And they went here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll and see who has gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Saul said to Ahia, Bring the ark of God here. For at that time the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Aven. So what we have here is we have a situation where, where uh, the nation of Israel is in combat with the Philistines. Remember with me that Saul has a son, and the son's name is Jonathan. And earlier, Jonathan had seen a garrison of the Philistines and had... Uh, desired to have combat with him, and he had actually gone and uh, had, had a, some combat with them. And then later on, on a second occasion, there was a second garrison that uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer went and uh, actually attacked, and it created a tremendous uh, uproar. See, the first time that Jonathan had gotten into it with uh, this, this group of Philistines, uh, it had provoked a hornet's nest response, and so thousands of chariots and horsemen and infantry had drawn up to, uh, uh, to uh, up into Israel and had, had begun to uh, make preparation to go at war with them, to go into battle with them. And so when that was taking place, Jonathan and his armor bearer decided to go and see what they were up to and provoked them, a garrison into a fight, ultimately routed them, and it had created a great repercussion in the life of the nation of Israel. Verse 15 here says, there was trembling in the camp in the field and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled and the earth quaked so that it was very great trembling. And so uh, there was a tremendous move and the Philistines even recognized this as being the hand of God. You see, early in the history of Israel in the book of Exodus chapter 23 verse 27 God had said, I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the peoples to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And so God had made a promise to them, and this is what has taken place. God is working on behalf of the nation of Israel. Now, as this is taking place, the Philistines are becoming aware of the fact that through this, through this uh, earthquake and all that, the God of Israel is on Israel's side, and it's created great panic in their troops. And so in verse 16, it tells us, the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away. And they went here and they went there. And Saul said to the people who were with them, call the, call the roll, see who has gone from us. And when they had called roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Saul said to Ahia, bring the ark of God here. Uh, for that, at that time, the ark of God was with the children of Israel. And so Saul's spies have seen that the Philistines are in full retreat. They inform him of what has taken place. His response is to call roll, discovers Jonathan and his armor bearer are not present. He's not sure what this all means, and so according to verse 18, he wants to inquire of God as to what has happened. So he calls Ahia, who's the priest, in order that Ahia may ask of God so that God can give them an answer. 
Well, it says in verse 19, it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle. Indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was a great confusion. And so what happens is, as this is taking place, and he's asking the priest to, to uh, ask of God what is taking place, and the priest is in process of doing so, as this takes place, he is distracted. Saul is distracted by the sound that he's hearing. It says that it, while well, Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase, so Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. He's distracted. And so this gives us some insight into Saul. This gives us insight into his shallowness. It also gives us insight into his lack of faith. This noise, the noise of the retreating Philistines has distracted him. And so instead of continuing his inquiry of the Lord, he simply is telling the priest, never mind. So the ease of this distraction reveals something of his shallowness and it reveals something of his lack of faith. If he were truly desiring God's direction, he would have been praying with more fervency. If he were truly seeking the Lord, he would have prayed with the, with the kind of expectation uh, that would have, uh, would have been necessary for that moment. And the Bible tells us that we're to pray with a, a fervency. The uh, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, James tells us in chapter 5, verse 16. So there's this attitude of expectation and an attitude of fervency that goes into our prayer life. And there are times when something has happened in, in your life, there's something that has happened in my life that, that when I'm praying, I cannot be distracted because I'm so intense on what I'm speaking to the Lord about, I might not even notice somebody entering into the room until they tap me on the shoulder or interrupt me where they may say, excuse me, pastor, I need to ask you something. There are times that that has happened, and it happens infrequently. It's not every time I pray, but it does happen. And there are times when I'm really seeking the Lord and really wanting to know what God wants about something, that no matter what's going on, you're not being distracted. There are some who are praying so intensely, a, a, an explosion could go off next to them. They wouldn't even notice it. I mean, they're seeking the Lord. But in the case of, of Saul, he's distracted immediately. First, he's asking the priest, Go and seek the Lord and find out what is taking place. This, this, this in, enormous army is melting away. Ask God what this means. And, and so even as he is making inquiry of the Lord, because Saul is distracted by the sound of the Philistines in full retreat, he tells him, withdraw your hand. That's enough. I'm really not interested. Let's go out and see what's taking place. And so that's what happens. If he were truly desiring God's direction, he had been praying with more concern. Well, in verse 21, moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp of the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. You see, when the Philistines entered in and began to occupy, oftentimes there'd be towns and villages, and they would be occupying that were inhabited by Hebrews. And so these Hebrews were into forced servitude to the Philistines, and they had to accompany them as they went on on their way to battle. But now that the Philistines are evaporating, these people who had been conscripted into their service is now uh, on the side of the nation of Israel because that's where their hearts were all along. Verse 22 says, All the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. These are the ones who had been afraid at first, and, and now that they see God is really on their side, they get courage and they move out and, and they see God moving, and so they're going to naturally be on the side of, of the nation. It says in verse 23, So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Aven. And so this is what's taking place here. God is saving them. The people are becoming aware of them him doing that, but Saul is revealing something about himself. And you'll see this more clearly in verse 24. The men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats anything or any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Now all the people of the land came to a forest, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping. But no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. 
Therefore he stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his countenance brightened. And so once again we see Saul's rashness as well as his ineptitude. He had given strict orders. I don't want anybody eating until evening. And he put them under an oath. But I want you to notice that he didn't want them to eat any food until he had been satisfied by victory. In other words, he was concerned with his own glory and his own honor, and much more concerned with that than he was for their strength. So the soldiers have entered into a wood, and as they enter into the wood, there's a honeycomb on the ground. And they're hungry. They're famished. They've been at war. They've been battling. They need some, some strength. But none of them will touch that because they made this oath. And so here comes Jonathan. As Jonathan walks in, he sees the honey there. He takes the, his, the rod that he has in his hand and he dips it and takes some of the honey. And immediately the Bible tells us that he was brightened. And in other words, he gained strength from this. But at this point, as he does this, somebody says something to him. Notice verse 28. One of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. They were so hungry that they were fainting there. It was too late to stop Jonathan. So all they could, could do was tell him, You just violated the oath. Your father made everybody swear. Well, Jonathan's response is interesting. Verse 29, Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? My father's command was foolish. You're the ones who fought. You're the ones who won. You should have been refreshed. And in my father having you make this oath, it only reveals something of my father's foolishness. Ecclesiastes in chapter 5 verse 2 says, Do not be rash with your mouth. Let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Don't promise God what you don't plan on keeping. Don't make promises to God that you're going to break later on. It's like that guy out there in the ocean and he's been swimming and he gets a cramp. And he starts to try and make it into shore. And before you know it, he's telling God, if you save my life, you know, I'll go in the mission field for you. I'll, I'll serve you all. That Just God, save my life. I'm going to drown. He makes it halfway in. He says, God, if you just save my life, I'm going to serve you, Lord. If you just save my life, I'll serve you. Then he finally makes it to the shore. And he says, thank you, God, for saving me. I'll go to church in a couple of weeks. You know, it's that mentality of, you know, sometimes you make these promises to God, but you really aren't intending to keep them. Don't make rash vows to God. Don't make oaths to God. Let your words be few because what happened with Saul is Saul made this rash vow to God, but it's going to cost. It says in verse 31, they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajilon. So the people were very faint. That's about 15 miles. And the people rushed on the spoil and took sheep, oxen, and calves and slaughtered them on the ground. And the people ate them with the blood. Then they told Saul, saying, Look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. So he said, You've dealt treacherously. Roll a large stone to me this day. Then Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep. Slaughter them here and eat. Do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. So every one of the people brought his ox with him that night and slaughtered it there. What happened is they're so hungry they need to eat. And they violated the law of God. There's a couple of things here that, that you need to be aware of. One is according to the law in the book of Leviticus in chapter 22 verse 28, according to that portion of scripture, you never slaughter a calf and its mother on the same day. You do not slaughter the calf and the mother on the same day. So they are slaughtering calves and their mothers on the same day, thus violating the law. Secondly, according to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 12, you don't eat the flesh with blood. What they would do when they slaughtered the meat is they would hang it up so that the blood would drain from it properly. But the Bible here says that they, would, they got the animals, they slaughtered it there on the ground, and that means they didn't drain it of its blood. 
And so in violation of the law on those two points, they are now going to be judged or dealt with by God. Now Saul gets upset about this, and Saul says, roll over here a big rock. The reason the rock is being brought to him is so that they can take the meat that they're slaughtering, their own cattle, and they can actually hang the carcasses on that rock so that it drains properly. And he's trying to keep the Lord from bringing judgment on the people because of the improper way that they're dealing with this. Well, as this is taking place, verse 35, and I'm going to spend some time looking at this with you by point of application. It says, Saul built an altar to the Lord. This was the first altar that he built to the Lord. This altar that was being built is intended to be an expression of gratitude for the victory God has granted over, over the Philistines. It's interesting how it says here, this was the first altar that he built to the Lord because there's no record after this one altar of him ever building a second one. This is the only altar that he ever built. And it doesn't impress the Lord whatsoever. You see, what he's doing is he's doing something religious. He's actually joining in a long line of men who had gone on before him who built altars to God. And when they would build these altars to God, they were being dedicated to God because God had done something or met them in a certain way. So the altar would be built there as a place of communication and remembrance between that individual and their God. And so you have a lot of people in the Bible who are well known to us who are known for building altars. You can look all the way in Genesis, in chapter 8, verse 20. And there you find a man by the name of Noah. And it says in Genesis 8, 20, Noah built an altar to the Lord. You can look in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. And it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, To your descendants I will give this land. There he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. We know that Abram became an altar builder because he built at least four altars. Then you have Isaac, his son, in Genesis 26, verse 25. And it says that Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. You have Moses in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, where it says that Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. You have a man by the name of Joshua in chapter 8, verse 30, which says Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. You have Gideon in Judges 6.24 where it says Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. You have Samuel in 1 Samuel 7 verse 17 how it says Samuel built an altar to the Lord in his hometown of Ramah. The thing is is these men were building altars in commemoration and, and worship to God. Whereas Saul is using it as a religious symbol. There are a lot of people who like religious symbols who even wear religious symbols because they associate with the symbol but not necessarily with the God who originated the symbol. I had people say this to me before. I've heard it just this last week. Oh, the guy's a Christian. How do you know he's a Christian? He wears a cross. There are a lot of people who wear crosses. There are a lot of people who use it as an article of jewelry. They wear crosses because it's, it, they like it for some reason, so they wear their cross. There are a lot of people who do that. They have crosses that they wear. Sometimes they tattoo their body with crosses. Sometimes they buy clothing that has crosses. You know, and it's a symbol for them. And they want to use this. And in some ways, they look at it as being almost like a good luck charm of some sort. So they carry the religious things with them. They want to have something with them that has religious significance. But it's not that they really honor the God who is symbolized by that. It's just that they use the symbol for themselves. And this is what Saul's doing. He's building an altar, but it's not something that's sincere. Before I got saved, I had a friend of mine who had started going to this small church called Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. And uh, he gave to me one of these little pocket Bibles. It really was a little red book, and it had promises from the Bible. And he said, Dave, you ought to read this. And in reality, what, it, what he wanted to do is to get me starting to read the Bible so I could read things about God and salvation. And that's what this little Bible was supposed to do. It had selected verses there that were supposed to help the person who's reading it to see God's plan of salvation. And so he gave me this little red pocket Bible. Now, I was one of these guys. If you gave me a Bible or something religious, I wasn't about to throw it in the trash, so I would carry it with me. 
So I got this red Bible, and I still remember, and I put it in my back pocket. I, I didn't throw it away, but I never read it either. I just couldn't get myself to throw it away. So I carried it in my back pocket. But I was into drugs and things, and a friend of, some friends, three friends of mine, and I had taken off together. I had this 1962 Ford Falcon station wagon. It, I had painted the windows black, and I had a peace flag in the back window so you couldn't look into this, this uh, wagon. My dad used to call it my hippie wagon. And, and I drove my friends into L.A., and we were looking for a party or something. And I remember pulling over in an industrial zone, and we had some hash. Some of you know what that is. We had some hash. And so we started smoking hash. And as I was there in the back there, because I had, I had taken the seats and put them down, and I had put in a mattress and blankets and things, I, I could sit in there with my friends, and we could party. And so my friends and I are there smoking hash. And... And as we're there smoking, we look and I see this light, something's pulling up behind us. And I look and it's a police cruiser. And so we're smoking hash in, in, in my car. And so I, I jump into the driver's seat and one of the guys jumps into the passenger seat. And I'm looking in my rearview mirror until this officer comes walking up the side, taps on the window. I roll the window down. My eyes are bright red from smoking this hash and all. And, and he begins to speak to me. I still remember some of the conversation. And asked me, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, we're just kind of hanging around, you know, got lost and pulled over. He said, you're not doing any drugs or drinking, are you? You know, my eyes are bright red. and He's got the flashlight in my eyes. And I said, oh, no, 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 of course not, officer. And I stuck my hand in my back pocket and I pulled out this red Bible. And I said, I don't do drugs, man. I got something better than drugs. Because these hippies had been telling me Jesus is better than drugs. So I just was there going, yeah, you know, I got, you know, Jesus is better than drugs. I am wasted on hash, holding a Bible, saying, no. You, and people will do that. They do it to this day. They have their crosses. They have their T-shirts that say things, slogans and all of that. They carry the little Bibles, but they don't read them and they don't live it. And that's what Saul was doing. He built an altar, an altar that gave the impression that he really sought God. But we have already seen that he's not seeking God because when he has an opportunity to ask of God what is taking place through the priest, he tells the priest, stop seeking him. Let's go see what's taking place. He doesn't have a heart like that. And a lot of people are very similar to that. Religious symbols, as if that's going to save you. Many years ago, over 20 years ago now, I received a phone call in the office. A young lady had called and had said, I'd like to dedicate my, my child to the Lord. And we have dedications. And I said, well, that's wonderful. Do you go, go here? And we began to speak. No, I don't go there. My mom would like us though, to me to dedicate my child. I said, well, can you explain some things to me about, you know, what's your walk with the Lord? And long story made short, uh, she wasn't a Christian. Uh, she wasn't married. She wanted her boyfriend to come up with the child, and all three of them wanted to do that. But they wanted to do it for mom's sake, not because they had a relationship with God. And so I said to her, you know, this dedication of the child to the Lord is, is, is more than simply us holding a baby up and praying for it. I said, it, it is really not the child so much that I pray for as for the family. Because the child, if the child is raised in a Christian home, has a good opportunity and a good chance of coming to faith in Christ. And so what I really am praying for is mom and dad to raise the child to know Jesus Christ. I said, so if you don't have a relationship with the Lord and your boyfriend and you aren't even married and yet you're saying together you want to raise the child to have faith in Christ, you really need to get right with God. So she says, so you're not going to dedicate my baby. And I said, I can't dedicate your baby until you get right with God and put things right the way they ought to be. Well, she got upset, obviously, and she, she says, well, thank you anyway, and hangs up. A couple of weeks later, a friend of mine tells me that they knew of the cir circumstances, and they said, you know, she was at such and so church. She dedicated her baby in church this last weekend. The same girl who had been told this is, it's wrong for you to do that, had found a way around it. She simply called another church, didn't tell them her circumstances, and uh, wanted to do it as a religious act so that her mom might think that she was doing well with the Lord. Sometimes we have baptisms here, and people will go out to the baptism and go into that water and be water baptized, not because they have a right relationship with God, but because it'll get their mom and dad off their back 
because mom and dad won't be bothering me anymore because they're going to see I'm baptized and they'll think I'm serious with God. When in reality, they're not serious at all. They're just washing their flesh. They're just going into the water and coming out and buying themselves some time to continue in the life that they've been living. See, religious symbolism doesn't save you. It's a walk with God that does. And here we have Saul with an altar. And it's an altar that he's built as a memorial and thanks offering to God for what God has done. But in reality, he doesn't have a real heart for the Lord. Now, as this is taking place, verse 36, Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light. And let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. Then the priest said, Let us draw near to God here. So Saul asked counsel of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. And Saul said, Come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and, uh, and know and see uh, what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But not a man among the people answered him. Then he said to all Israel, you be on one side, and my son Jonathan and I will be on the other, other side. And the people said to Saul, Do what seems good to you. Therefore Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. In other words, show us who's, who's innocent. So Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. Saul said, Cast lots between my son Jonathan and me. Jonathan was taken. Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you've done. Jonathan told him and said, I only tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, so now I must die. Saul answered, God do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. But the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan and he did not die. Then Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. So he says, let's find out what the Lord wants to do. Pray and seek the Lord. Well, the Lord's not answering, so Saul comes to realize somebody sinned. Somebody must have done something. They broke the oath. So he gets the soldiers on one side. He and his son stand on the other. They cast the lot. All of the soldiers are excused. Not a single one of them uh, is guilty. And so now it's left between Saul and his son Jonathan. The last, the, the lot is cast and it falls on Jonathan. And that's why he gets upset. What have you done? And, and Jonathan's immediate response is, I really didn't do anything. I was hungry. I tasted of some honey. Well, you're going to die for doing that. But the people say, are you kidding me? It's because of Jonathan that we had this great victory. He was innocent. He was ignorant of the oath. He did not take that oath. And so they rescue him, and they take him out of the hand of his father. His father was bent on putting him to death. But they said, no, once again, this reveals the character of Saul. And once again, it shows how impetuous he is. Well, as this is taking place, in verse 47, Saul established his sovereignty over Israel. And he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he harassed them. And he gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. The sons of Saul were Jonathan, Yeshua, Melchishua, the names of his two daughters were there. The name of the firstborn, Merib. The name of the second, or younger, Michal. The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaaz. The name of the commander of his army was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul. Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. Now there was fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. Two things. There are commentators who look at Philistines in a variety of ways. One is they're quite obviously a historic people that were plaguing Israel for centuries. They were a literal people that plagued Israel for centuries. But there's also a type 
that's involved. They represent the flesh. God has called us to a commitment to him, a commitment that is full on, a commitment that is real. When I was sharing with the men this last Friday at the men's retreat, I was sharing with them about loving God. And the Bible says very clearly that you are to love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, with all that is within you. And I was sharing with the men and I said, you know, the Lord has never anywhere in Scripture given to us a command to love Him sporadically. Nowhere does the Bible ever teach that a person is to follow Christ once a week or twice a week even. The Bible teaches us that I'm to love God completely with everything that is within me. That there's no compromise in that but a full-on commitment to that. I am called by God to follow God and to love Him with all that is in within myself and secondly I'm also to be a person who has a consistent walk with God Jesus didn't say pick up your cross occasionally and follow me Jesus said pick up your cross daily and follow me and so what God calls us to and I was sharing with them in this what God calls us to is a hundred percent commitment on a daily basis for an entire lifetime it's not a part-time calling by God he didn't call me to follow him once a week, twice a week, three times a week, but every day of the week. Not once a month, every day of the month. Not one month out of a calendar year, but every month in that year, all the days of my life. God calls us to full-on commitment 24-7 every day and to love him as we do so. And so nowhere do you ever find in the Bible that God gives to us part-time callings. He calls us to follow him full time, regardless of whether we're pastors, whether we drive trucks, whether we are people who are working in an office or own a business or whatever it may be. God has called us to follow him in whatever state we're in consistently. As a student, as a wife, as a, a son or daughter, God has called us to do that. And I was sharing that with the men. But there are things that work against us doing that. And there are things in our flesh that war against the things of the Spirit. And so the things that I desire to do very often are the things I don't do. And the things that I don't desire to do are the things that I find myself doing. And like the Apostle Paul, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And so it's a constant warfare. And if you don't overcome your flesh, your flesh will overcome you. That's what happens. It'll overcome you. The things that were occasional sins become the habit of your life. And it's what you become known for. I encourage the men, even as I encourage myself, as I encourage us to realize that there are works of the flesh that are constantly things that we deal with, things that we die to. The Philistines are a type of the flesh in the life of Saul. And I want you to notice there was a fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. He fought but never overcame. He fought but he never won. And secondly... When Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. When you don't trust in the arm of the Lord, you will trust in the arm of flesh. When you're not seeking God, you'll seek help from man. And that's exactly what he did. Anytime he saw a valiant man, anytime he saw a warrior, he would just conscript him into his army and made him one of his men. He wanted to build up his army with the most valiant men in the nation of Israel. It's interesting how when you're introduced to David, now David, who becomes the king of Israel, is introduced as a man who is a warrior, a proven warrior. Very often when you think of David, perhaps if you think anything like I once did, you may be thinking of David as, as a man who had a gentle spirit, he was a loving man, most definitely a musician and loved to sing songs to the Lord and he wrote so many songs, a very deep man and everything. But we also need to remember David as a warrior. And when Saul was in need on one occasion, one of his men said, there's a young man by the name of David who is a warrior. He spoke of him in that way. This was a man who was valiant. This was a man who was a powerful man. And this was a man that eventually became an armor bearer to King Saul. One of his trusted men, his trusted, trusted guy who carried the armor. He was the most trusted man. That's what David became to Saul. Loved him like a father. But David, the Bible tells us, has a heart after God. And Saul never did. Saul never did. David was a man you can look to, even though he had his failures and they're well known. But when God spoke concerning him, he said, I have sought for a man for myself who has a heart after me. And that man was David. 
Saul, on the other hand, Saul was a man who would accumulate people around him who could be his armor bearer, who could be his, his uh, elite forces. Because when you stop trusting God, you begin trusting in the arms of men. That's what you do. When you stop trusting the Lord, you will trust in a man to save you. You will trust in a system to save you. You will trust in everything except the one who can save you. And that's what happened here. One, he fought constantly but never won the battle over the Philistines. He never won the battle over his own flesh. And we'll see that at the end of his life. And two, he didn't depend on God. He ultimately depended on man. And somebody who didn't depend on God and depended on man, he ultimately reaped the consequences for that. He had the appearance of religion. We ought to pray. Let's make spiritual oaths. I'm going to hold fast to this oath. You guys shouldn't have violated Moses' law. He had the appearance of religion, but when it came down to it, he ultimately simply trusted in men, and he fought for his own glory. That's how he began this. I will, I will avenge myself on these people. He fought for his own glory and not the glory of the Lord, and ultimately he ends up with no glory. Because when you don't win the battle over your flesh and when you trust in men, you're doomed to failure because you're not trusting in the right one, the one who can deliver you. And we will see that more clearly as we look in the life of a man named King Saul. Father, we ask that you would continue working in our lives. We ask that you would continue to reveal to us any areas of our own lives, Lord, that we don't trust you in. In Jesus' name, I would ask that you would work in us even now, Lord, because there are areas of our lives that we might even be putting on like we're spiritual. We can carry the Bible. We can come to church. We can do all the religious things, when in reality, Lord, our hearts are far from you. I would pray even now that you would work within us and that you would have your way in us, Lord. Our eyes are closed. Our heads are bowed. Perhaps I have some in this room right now who need to get right with the Lord. And you know it. I want to pray for you right where you're at. And if you have a need to get right with Jesus, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right now? Just raise your hand so I might see you. Lord, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you right now. I ask that you would reach down and you would touch each individual. May they have a sense of peace coming upon them as you're washing them and cleansing them now. You said if we confess our sin that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And even now, Lord, as their hands are raised to you and they're asking for your help and coming to you, I ask that you'd wash and cleanse them now. And now I pray that you'd fill them with your spirit and that from this point on, they'll live for you and walk with you. So we give you praises and glory for these things, Lord, and receive from you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And Father, I ask that you keep moving in all of us to your glory in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. You know, we're uh, approaching Memorial, Memorial Day and all, and I would encourage you today to not forget the cost for us to have the freedoms that we have. We have Memorial Day because we're commemorating those who lost their life defending the freedoms that we possess and take for granted. I was sharing with the Second Service today how that Many years ago now, a few years ago now, I was with my father before he went home to be with the Lord, and we were in Israel together. And my dad was seated across from me on the bus, and I was talking to my dad. And, and my dad is a World War II vet. He served on the USS Pennsylvania with the U.S. Navy. The USS Pennsylvania had been uh, sunk uh, in Pearl Harbor, but had been recommissioned and was used during World War II. And my dad served on that particular battleship. And when I was a little boy, my dad had one of these little albums that he brought home from the, from the service, and it had pictures of the ship and pictures of him at the age of 18 and all of that. And, and I still remembered that. And so I was speaking to my dad, and I said, Dad, I said, when you were in, uh, in uh, the Navy and you were there off the coast of Japan, what happened? that your ship got torpedoed. And my dad said, you know, son, he says, we were there. He said the Pacific fleet was lined up. He said they were getting ready for an invasion of Japan. And he said it was night. It was uh, all the lights were to be off. It was to be totally, totally dark and everything. He said, and we could hear the sound of, uh, of an airplane. He said, 
coming in the midst. He said, and we, we, we believed it had to be one of ours because who would be foolish enough to fly in the midst of the Pacific fleet like that? He said, well, it turned out it was a Japanese uh, kamikaze, he said, and he had a torpedo. And he said, and as he's coming, he actually released the, the torpedo. My dad was in the front of the, of the ship, and he says, I, I, I could hear the sound of something hit the water. He said, and then there's the sound of an explosion. He said, and the ship lifted up, he said, out of the water. It lifted with the, with the, 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 the impact. It had hit where there were all these shells stored and everything, he said, and the explosion was incredible. And as he spoke to me, my dad, and this was over 50 years after this took place, my dad's eyes began to water, and my dad teared up and began to cry. And my dad said, we lost a lot of good boys that day, son. We lost a lot of good boys. And I was hit by that. I thought, over 50 years later, and my dad cannot speak about this without tears. Freedom is not free. It costs it cost the lives of brave men and women so that you and I today could be here in this place worshiping God. Let us not forget it. Let us not forget the freedoms that we have that were hard-earned and sometimes paid for with human blood, with the blood of, our, of our, our Navy, our Marines, our Air Corps, Coast Guard, our Army. Let's not forget this, and let's be grateful on Memorial Day for the freedoms that God has given to us. God has been good to us. And we need to thank him for that. Father, we would thank you even now. And I thank you that we're able to gather here in this place. May we not take the freedoms that we have for granted. We give you praise and we give you thanks. And Lord, we especially thank you for the sacrifice of your son Jesus who died for us. We bless you, Lord. We have opportunities to grow in him tonight, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Lord, so many opportunities. May we take advantage of them and grow in him, that we might serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One last thing. Let's thank our worship team today for the beautiful worship.